One of the most important things that happen for role players and solo role players in particular in the past couple of years was the publication of Iron Sworn. And one of the most exciting things coming up this year and next year is the publication of Starforged, which is basically Iron Sworn in space. What I've got here is a demo video for you on Starforged based on the Kickstarter preview materials that are being released to backers. And following the new format of my videos, we're going to get right into the story. But if you go to the second or second two thirds part of the video, you will see how I developed the story. I do want to say that from my perspective, as well as the perspective of the designer of Iron Sworn and Star Forged, the creation of the story is part of the play. My decision to flip my videos in this way and show the end product of the building up of the story first is because I think when people watch videos, it can be interesting to see the story as it has been developed before looking at the underside of this. This is something I've changed in just recent, fairly recently in videos, and there's been a good response to it, but I don't want in any way to suggest that the first third or so of the video that you're seeing with the, the, the outcome of all the decision-making is just the play part of the story. You might envision that as the player part of the story, but the being the GM part of the story, the making of the decisions, the thinking about and creating the world in this case of Starforged, all of that is part of play. And one of the things that distinguishes solo RPGing from RPGing with a group is the fact that you're acting obviously as the GM as well as the player. And both aspects of that are part of the gameplay. Sage Vega glanced over at the utility bot seated next to her in the company Starship. For a moment, she wondered what it thought as they barreled through space, fresh off a paint job at Jerry's Phantom Fix-It Shop. But then she caught herself and reminded herself that this was just a bot, not one of the poor, trapped, almost sentient AIs that Vega Industries was cashing in on. She felt the hot fire of the iron shard next to her body, pulsating with energy and purpose, as if it approved of this flight. The oldest daughter of the youngest son of Silver Vega, his empire spread across many planets as his monopoly on the perfect AI enhancements knew no bounds. The Vega family made billions from creating almost human AI bots for the rich and famous to do with what they pleased. Sage, known as static to everyone but her parents, was a scoundrel and a scavenger, seemingly ignoring the wealth around her as she patched together a rebel life. This life had been turned upside down when Kirsa, one of the line workers, was banished to a desert world in the Kronos Channel. He had come to her with proof of her family's corrupt dealings in the souls of humanity, but before she could learn everything, he was exposed and gone. Her immediate goal was to find him, piloting this company spaceship that she had stolen and disguised with pieces of scrap. She looked down at the ancient book resting next to the last message she had ever received from her grandfather, a magical so-called emotional relic. Available to only the most wealthy, these relics could capture the feeling of a person when that person was no longer alive. It was the closest humanity could come to everlasting life. Sage knew that her grandfather would approve of her mission, even though it put her at odds with the family who had raised him and given him wealth beyond his imaginings. As Static is piloting this ship, She's looking for Kirsa the Mole. She's, she needs to land on this desert planet and find him. And that's her immediate goal at this point. The things that are the most important to her are finding out what it was that he was starting to tell her when, the, when he was captured and the revelation of the nefarious dealings of her family that she didn't really have any knowledge of before is what is motivating her here. And that this molten iron sword piece that she 
swore the sacred shard that she swore her vow on to avenge the the trapped souls of all these AIs is with her. And as is this message, this mandate from her grandfather, somehow this feeling that she has that he would approve of her of her goals here. But the first thing, so the first thing we're doing is we're finding Kirsa and we are trying to, we're, we're sort of in the middle. We're not really undertaking an expedition. We're, we're in the middle here, really, of this. We are, we're, we're traveling here. So I think we're, we're, we're traveling, we're rolling with our wits because we are possibly being chased by security of not possibly like definitely they must have discovered at this point they must have discovered that we have stolen this company spaceship and it we already had it patched over to to take away the the, the logos and things of our company but the shape is very distinctive so um we need to we need to this mission here is a first of all this mission mission here is a dangerous one and um, we need to we need to travel with our staying vigilant here. So we rolling with our wits, but this is a a miss. We are waylaid by some situation here, and it is not going to be. We don't get to mark any progress at all toward finding Kirsa. Something is going to happen. We have to pay the price here. And I'm going to roll some oracle dice here and just see what. Um, what fate has in store for us, 22? A surprising development complicates your quest. Well, that to me is obvious. The surprising development here is that this utility bot that is with us that we were pretty sure was just a very simple utility bot is actually not just a simple utility bot and is in fact one of the AIs that was on its way to sentience. And as we are trying to land our vessel here, it speaks to us and it comes to some type of life that is shocking to us and disturbing to us. And the question then becomes, is it going to be grateful to us for trying to save it or is it going to be our enemy and try to either attack us or reveal our position somehow to the Vega Industries and I think here we're just going to go with a I don't know I have no idea so we're going to go with a 50-50 chance um and is the is if we got a 51 or greater it's going to be friendly to us. And um, lower than that, it's going to not be. 65, so it is going to be friendly to us. And now we have some form of an ally and we look at it with new respect and some degree of concern for its safety. Thematically, what this says to me is that we this utility bot has more than helpful tools at hand. It's going to converse with us in some manner, and it's actually going to help us find Kirsa and direct us toward the proper place to land on the planet. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a move by directing it to help us and to um, cause us to land in a manner that we'll be able to find Kirsa. So we're going to roll plus its health, and that's its current health is a four, so we're going to um, roll plus four and see, get one momentum on a hit here. So let's see if we can successfully use it to land and definitely, we didn't even really need its help. So we're going to take a plus one momentum here on this landing. We don't get any, we don't get any additional benefit, but we have landed now on this desert planet and need to, we've heard that Kirsa is in some um, sort of petrified rock area of the planet and the utility bot has helped us land close to where we need to go. So we're making some progress toward finding Kirsa, but we have to exit 
the exit this area and look around. As we as we exit here, I think what we what we're doing is the move we're making is gathering information. And as a scavenger, we're going to take a plus one, and we're also going to take a plus one momentum if we get a hit. So we're going to gather information. And so we're rolling with our wits, which is two plus one is three, and we'll get some extra momentum. Basically, we, we need to try to figure out where Kirsa is. Now, there was this rumor that something about a petrified forest, but this, this looks like a pretty bleak area. And so we indeed, that was a strong hit so that our scavenger nature brought us, as our wits brought us forward to a strong hit on that. So we're going to get plus two momentum and two ticks on our Discovery's legacy track. That's cool. Let's see, what are we going to, what are we going to discover? So let me, all right, we're going to go to this Oracle table and see what, something about what we're seeing. 39 is exposed. Oh, an exposed artifact, an exposed artifact. Okay. There's a random table here, make a discovery. If we uncover something wondrous, we can roll on this to see what it is. So I think that's what I'm going to do because an exposed artifact sounds pretty wondrous. We got a 56, which is a mysterious device or artifact of potential value. Well, I think clearly what this is telling us is perhaps this is a remnant. It's exposed in these dust storms. Perhaps this is a remnant of something that Kirsa, when Kirsa left, brought with him and is somehow exposed here. Maybe this is a sign that Kirsa went into hiding. Maybe this is a remnant of the fact that Kirsa had been in this place, but then had to leave. So I'm going to say that this is, looks like it's sending us in the direction of finding Kirsa, but as we look around, we don't see Kirsa. We just see a remnant of something that we're going to collect when we collect this thing, what is the feeling of this thing? I'm going to roll on this theme, this artifact, the feeling of the artifact one, ability. Yes, so this is telling me that the artifact that we have found is somehow related to, it's a piece of or an aspect of something that we need to understand the situation with the AI. Maybe whatever Kirsa's evidence was that he was piecing together to prove what was going on. This is a piece of it, but we still, uh, so I've got this exposed artifact and I'm going to just assume I can take it. It is something I can carry. It's nearby. We're not going to, we're not going to further search for it. So we have it now and it is something co connected to this ability. That's all abstracted, but I need to, I haven't seen Kirsa. I don't see evidence of Kirsa. So we need to continue to travel on this or to to wander around this planet and try to actually locate Kirsa and to do that I'm actually going to go to I'm going to outside of Starforge back to Delve because I want to find a way to have some random trying to keep all this random scenario where it's going to explain what happens when I am moving and we're either going to find an opportunity or reveal a danger but we're first going to go to the first going to go to the or the general oracle and ask what's the what's the chance that we're going to find an opportunity as opposed to a danger so we're going to say that i think it's i think it's it's pretty unlikely that we would find an opportunity we're they're more in a dangerous situation and indeed we're not going to find an opportunity. This is not hospitable as we, as we already knew, really. We're going to reveal a danger. And what is that danger going to be? This may not work 100%, but let's see what the roll is. We rolled a 15. And 15 says check the theme card. This isn't going to line up exactly, but I think in looking at the themes, I think we're probably closest here toward a Ravage theme. All right, we're back to Starforge, which we probably didn't even need to leave in the first place. This is the location theme area. We've already determined that we are in a ruined location. So let's let's get something about the nature of this place. This is going to be, oh, it's inhabited. It's inhabited by what? Or it's inhabited 11 being. It's inhabited being, but we don't think it is 
I, I think I already determined this wasn't Kirsa because why would Kirsa have left this artifact here? Maybe the artifact was not from Kirsa. Maybe the artifact is a remnant. It was revealed. Maybe it was an artifact that had belonged to the, the, the inhabited beings here. And in fact, in fact, I wonder if these inhabited, if this is inhabited by the, these horrors of these souls of the AIs, maybe they're collected here in some way. Let's, let's get a little bit more information about this place. Let's get an action and a theme here and see 72. 72 raid perhaps we're being directed we should go in here 46 hope hmm well that is telling me so we it's inhabited by beings we're getting a, a raid and a hope well this is telling me that indeed the we should be going in here and the hopeful part is maybe this is the location of it could be Kirsa, but i'm feeling it's not Kirsa, but Maybe the location of these abstracted beings that were trapped, or maybe they're waiting for us to be released. So I think we are going to go in. So the question is, will there be an opportunity here? And 51 or greater, it will be an opportunity. 97, there's going to be an opportunity. So great. Let's go to the, as we enter this sand ravaged ruin of some sort. All right. So we're going to get an opportunity and we're going to see what is the opportunity. 41, interesting or useful device or artifact, but there's beings here. I'm getting this theme. So we, we there's the exposed artifact and in here, it's like an interesting or useful device or artifact, but there, it's also inhabited by beings. So I think what we're learning is that the artifact are the souls, the beings are the artifacts, that somehow these AIs, we look around and we see kind of a red mist. And these are the beings and the souls that somehow we need to try to marshal. And maybe we need to, perhaps what Kirsa had been doing was interceding in the AI manufacturer at the moment of transformation and collecting these these souls here that are that need to be liberated oh, and the these are the lost souls that indeed this is not a place where Kirsa has had success but rather a place where these are the wandering souls that were never able to be successfully transformed. They were never able to be successfully liberated. And that's what we're coming to understand. Our so, quest is complicated because not only now are we trying to find Kirsa, but we have these souls floating in this area that we realize now need to be saved if we possibly can do it. So we now have another, we have a whole other mission really, which is to to save these souls in this, in this. To me, a couple things are evident now. First of all, this is, we have reached a milestone because we, we, we've done two things. We've gotten a new quest to do, which is to liberate these souls, but we've also reached a milestone in our original, in our overall background vow, our overall quest, because we have come to an understanding of the fact that Kirsa not only was thwarted, but thwarted in the middle of something so important that there are, there's this grouping of souls in this place. And we're going to investigate this place a little bit more, but that is akin to, this is making headway in our quest, I think. So we're going to mark progress per the rank of our, of our background vow, because I think that this does this is like a waypoint or a milestone in our understanding. And as we're standing here and as we're thinking about the, the implications of this, the philosophical, the ethical implications of this, the AI bot that is with us that we now know is connected to this journey of souls is we're getting a feeling that this AI bot is struggling to communicate something to us. And at the very same time that that's happening, our remnant our sword shard from that explosion is we're we're feeling some heat 
off of that and we're feeling, and it's not exactly becoming animated, but that it is, it is energy. It is giving off energy. And additionally, our emotional relic from our grandfather is giving us a strong sense that this is, this place is key. These souls are key maybe to finding Kirsa, to making progress on our mission. And the AI bot is struggling to communicate with us. And we are going to try to make a connection with it and understand what it is trying to say. And to do that, we're going to, I think we're going to, we're going to do this connection move. And, and this connection move is going to be abstracted to like, are we, is it trying to connect trying to understand what this AI bot is struggling to communicate to us. Because remember, this is one of those souls in limbo. So we're going to roll, we're going to be searching to, for this communication, we're going to be rolling plus heart and we have a three on heart. So let's see what, what we get with this attempt at communication with the AI bot, where that's going to lead us here. And we got a six six, oh, and a 10. So we've gotten a, we've just gotten a weak hit here. We could burn some momentum here to, to turn this into, we've got momentum to burn, but we're going to, we're going to leave it as is. Um, this is a weak hit. So the, the AI bot left in limbo as it is, is struggling to communicate with us. And we are getting basically confirmation that this is the right place, that we should continue to investigate. But the complication or the cost. We're going to just, we're going to roll on, we're going to roll on, we're going to go random here and see what the complication or cost is. And, we're going to do and to do that, we're going to go to this action and theme table and let's just get a sense 93. Surrender, hmm, surrender what? This is our complication 62. Surrender possession. Surrender possession. Well, at, this is this is what's happening. As we are here, we feel these this this red mist. These souls are coming in there. They're coming into our space, and they are going to take something from us. And we really only have three things. We've got the sh sacred shard, the ancient tome, and the emotional relic. They are going to take something very valuable from us, and. I don't know why they're going to take it. And let's just go to a D3 roll and see what, what they're going to take. So we're going to surrender possession here as a complication to them too of this ancient tome. And the ancient tome was the story of our original, our, the original mission of the family and how it went astray. And the souls are just they they take this book from us and we see it just sort of disintegrate in our eyes. It it turns to, um, in essence, dust, and it is absorbed by these souls. And perhaps they're using it to fuel their transformation toward sentience because the words they're they're consuming the words and the language and the direction and the intent of the original mission to free themselves. And, and as this happens, the, the, the mist starts to fade and starts to turn into this very dense fog. And then in the fog, from beyond the fog, we see actual physical beings. They have taken the words in this tome and created themselves, that these words were the final push they needed to get to humanity. And we find ourselves as we look around this desert cave, this sandy cave, a lone human among dozens of reanimated beings. I've decided to stop the video here because it's a nice cliffhanger. And it's also a moment where there are three or more different directions that I could take. And I think it'll provide a nice discussion point for my comments about not only this demo, but this system overall. And the three things I have listed here, there's, there's other options, of course, but to me, the, 
clear possibilities for moving on are either to go to the basic oracle to see if these beings are going to be friendly or not, and then develop out of that decision, or to kind of step back and go into more of a sector development, talk about developing this environment, really, this environment of a place with the lost souls. In a sense, there's no good place to leave off this video because Starforged, like its brethren, Ironsworn, is such a rich series of mechanics and invites further conversation, no matter what you do, that the the fact of the the very basic mechanic, which you saw some of in this video, the, the basic die rolling, the fact of this and the baked in narrative resolution system is the well from which everything springs. Adding on to that, the incredible oracle tables in this rule set from page 129 about using the oracles all the way down to 212 and beyond, there are, I, I hardly touch the surface of developing anything here with planets and settlements and either NPCs. We didn't really see an NPC. We had that AI bot coming to life that we had started out with this utility bot here. There's just so, so much. And in the format that I do my videos, this is the kind of outer limits of what I can demonstrate and show. There is, I, I, you know, it, it's sort of to say more about the system is pales, I think, in comparison to just watching it unfold. And the rest of this video is going to walk you through exactly how I got to the place of starting my story and exactly how I built up using what is present in the Starforged rules here to create a whole backstory, a whole set of motiva motivations and desires and inclinations for my main character. Moving on from here, as I said, from this aspect of the story, I could very easily go into developing more things about the sector and do that by stepping back and rolling on some random tables, give a name to the place of these lost souls that we're in, and even kind of bracket this whole, everything you've just seen, all aspects of this story, bracket it as just something that happened and then start a new scene. And if one was playing a campaign out, for example, one could do that. You could even leave this character, this static Vega character on their own here, create a whole new character somewhere else in the galaxy, and then come in and create a relationship, you know, have them doing something that is somehow related to this story. And perhaps, perhaps that is something that I'll do in a future video because I do foresee, looking into the future, I foresee another video, at least on Starforged. But I hope that this video up to now has given an example of the story that can develop. And I hope that you'll continue along watching the rest of this video, which is really taking you through all the elegant mechanics and thoughtful background world building that the designer has provided his players here. And again, I didn't even, for example, I don't think I used a settlement name. Um, it, it, there's just, there's just so much. And for somebody, you know, I have said on the channel that I wanted to do more space and sci-fi and haven't done it for reasons that are largely related to feeling not particularly comfortable or satisfied with rule sets that I'm aware of that have the the breadth and the expanse, but it's almost at the expense of just so much detail, which is what always sort of puts me off of Traveler every time I try to tackle that solo. It just feels overwhelming. Whereas here, the elegance of what Sean Tompkins has been able to do here and in Ironsworn in Giving you, and there's, I feel like there's even more oracles and random tables in, in here than there is in Ironsworn. 
to build up a world and to even create, we didn't get into any creatures here, to provide you with a toolkit for an entire universe in something that feels manageable and not overwhelming and still always gets back to this core mechanic of the the role that you're doing with your two D10s and your D6 and your modifiers, that the complexity of the universe is revolves around that very understandable and universal role. That's where the true magic of this system is, and that's where the true uniqueness of this system is. So I hope you'll continue along watching the video. The next section of this video describes how I got the story that you just saw played out. And I will, as mentioned, perhaps return to this character left here in some future video in some way in this universe. It would be hard to be more excited about the contents of a three ring binder than I am about this one. This is my Iron Sworn Starforge preview edition that as I sat down to film, I realized, unfortunately, I hole punched the wrong way because I can't show you this upside down. So I'm going to need to come back and unfortunately redo this with my three hole punch, one of my favorite RPG supplements, and show you the game. All right, that was painful, but I have re redone my preview edition of Starforged to be able to show it to you. And here are the credits to the game. Sean Tompkin, writing and design. Now, we're going to start by going to the Oracle tables here in the back and creating our, our sector, our world. I'll go, well, actually, let's, let's take a step. Let's give a little context here. In Iron Sworn Starforged, hereafter referred to as Starforged, you are a space-born hero sworn to undertake perilous quests. You will explore uncharted space, unravel the secrets of a mysterious galaxy, and build bonds with those you've met in your travels. Most importantly, you will swear iron vows to see them fulfilled, no matter the cost. You, it's a standalone sequel to Iron Sworn, and it says that if you know Iron Sworn, basically the core of the game will be familiar, and if you're new to Iron Sworn, the rulebook gives you everything you need to play here. So this is totally standalone as it says. The default tone for Starforged is gritty human-centric science fiction on a perilous frontier. This is a scavenged future with starships often cobbled together from salvage. People cling to survival on inhospitable worlds and in remote space stations. Much has been forgotten or lost. It's a dangerous life for anyone living on this frontier. Your adventures are set within the Forge. This is a globular cluster in orbit around your people's home galaxy. It is 1,700 year, light years above the galactic plane, a bright island in a dark void. Vast clouds of interstellar nebula span the depths of the forge, interspersed with denser clouds of vibrant interplanetary dust. Your people divide the forge broadly into four regions. The terminus, which is where your people landed following their exodus from their home galaxy, and settlements are common there, factions compete for resources, and spaceborne caravans follow charted paths among the stars. The Outlands. In the last few decades, your people have pushed deeper into the galaxy, searching for habitable planets, resources, and opportunities. Settlements within the Outlands are scattered, and navigation paths are often uncharted. The Expanse. A few bold pioneers have delved the far-flung reaches of the Forge, Isolated settlements have been built among these distant domains, but they are usually lost and disconnected from the settled regions. And then the void. Beyond the forge, there are only a few isolated stars and vast gulfs of nothing. And it says you'll learn more about this using the guided exercise starting on page 66 because we will be developing this. And here is the map. So I think with that background, we will go to page 66 and begin to develop our world here, our galaxy here. One thing I do want to say is I'm going to do as much as possible on video to show how you interact with this rule set. And for example, in choosing your truths, 
it says allow 45 to 60 minutes for this exercise. Obviously, I can't show you all of that in my channel in the way that I do videos. The truth categories are very broad-based sections to define key aspects of your setting, including cataclysm, which would be, I guess, like the inciting incident or how you got there, and what, what iron, the iron vows are sworn upon, laws, religion, magic, etc. We will go through some of them together, and I will go through some of them off camera. And in keeping with the perspective of the Iron Sworn world, you have options given as to how to do this. You can either choose your truth from three that are given. You can roll the Oracle dice, which is basically a D. They're showing two D10s here, but it's basically a D100 roll. Or, of course, you can customize it yourself. I think I'll probably do a mixture of those. But let's start on page 74, and we're just going to start with a random roll in the spirit of this game and many others that favor die rolling to get you somewhere. We rolled a 55 and the cataclysm on 55 is we were united in the prolonged war against an implacable foe, but our defeat was at hand. With the last of our defenses destroyed, our hope gone, we cast our fate to the forge. Here we can hide, survive. And our foe was, so we're, we're starting out by hiding or our world is, we're starting out by hiding from somebody and we rolled a six. So we're hiding from some AI that was our foe. And let's, let's continue on with some randomness. I like to start random because it gets my mind in the feeling of creating things on the fly and having to grapple with something that I have been given and make a connection. Six. So we'll roll again for the overall Exodus number. And we got a 17. When the Exodus fleet set off on a ponderous journey to a new home outside our galaxy, they marked the forge as their destination. Countless generations lived out their lives aboard these titanic ships during the millennia long passage. The refugees built a rich legacy of culture and tradition during the Exodus. Some even remained in the ships after their arrival in the forge, unwilling or unable to leave their familiar confines. I can relate to that. These, those vessels, the Iron Homes, are still sail the depths of this galaxy. I didn't read. There was a quest starter here. Your dreams are plagued by visions of a lost and crippled Exodus ship. What do you see? What does it call? Why does it call to you? Communities. We'll give a roll here for that. And we got a 46. Dangers abound, but there's safety in numbers. Many ships and settlements are united under the banner of one of the founder clans. We have a tentative foothold in this galaxy. Each of the five founder clans honor the name and legacy of a leader who guided their people in the chaotic time after the exodus. Vast reaches of the settled domains are claimed by the clans, and terminal skirmishes are common. Iron. We'll see what the iron vows are sworn upon. 78. The iron sworn bind their honor to iron blades. Aboard a starship where stray gunfire can destroy fragile equipment or pierce hulls, the brutality, the brutal practicality of a sword makes for a useful weapon. A few also favor the silent efficiency of a blade for infiltration. More, most importantly, when the Iron Sworn swear a vow upon a sword, they bind their commitment to the metal. If they forsake a vow, that iron must be abandoned. And looking here, we, you know, the basic choices here were the weaponry or something that is maybe a living metal or technology or something here that is more of a ship. That's what we got randomly. 71. Our communities are bound under the terms of the covenant. Most settlements are still governed under the under the covenant. So there's this is basically a sort of a lawful. We still have a remnants of some kind of law lawful society here. I tend to leave religion out of my gameplay altogether, so I'm probably not even going to bother noting that down. 63 magic. Supernatural powers are wielded by those rare people we call paragons. So magic is present, but rare. And let's see, where does the magic come from? 38. Psychic experimentation. It says, oh, while not magic in the truest sense, the abilities of the paragons are as close to magic as we can conjure. Okay. We're sort of in the middle here on 
the scale of what magic is or can be in our world. Communication and data sort of technology level, I guess, 50. Information is life. We rely on a guild of space-born couriers, the heralds, to transport messages and data across the vast distances. Again, in the middle here between not to between being in the dark ages of communication and being in sort of instant communication. So we have to, there are digital archives, but it's not always up to date or reliable the information. And the most important communications and discoveries are carried by the Herald. So sworn to see that data to his destination. This to me is maybe, this to me could possibly be some type of a quest starter here or something that I might be interested in exploring. I'm going to make uh, a special note of it here because here's a quest where you discovered a crippled herald ship. The pilot carrying a critical and time sensitive message is dead. Where was the message bound and why do you swear to see its destination? This is this is somewhat speaking to me maybe so I'm going to make a special note about that artificial, artificial intelligence. Now this is important because our original cataclysm, as you recall, was that we were fleeing from some kind of AI foe. And we got an 89 here. Artificial consciousness emerged in the time before the exodus, and sentient machines live with us here in the forge. Our ships, digital systems, bots, and other systems often house advanced AI. For a lone traveler, machine intelligence can provide companionship and aid within the perilous depths of the forge. So this is this is also significant to me because as I am as I am rolling up random things like this, whether it's here or in another game, when I get something that repeats itself in some manner, as here we have a specific we're at the highest sort of level of the AI concept here, and our exodus had to do with an AI foe, I I need to say that's a theme developing and figure out what is that theme and how does that impact my story. Because perhaps if we left and we exit, exit, if our exodus was caused by this AI foe, what happened to create that tension between our community and that foe? And it says here that in our world, these systems are extremely advanced. So perhaps what happened was that one became so advanced that it became borderline human. And perhaps we tried to, we recognize that the consciousness was at, at a certain level becoming cruel to not allow the transformation of that AI into a human. Perhaps that was why there was the exodus and the, the conflict with that other that other AI. Let me read, let me just go back and read. We were united in the prolonged war against a foe and it was the foe was AI. I think, I think this is, this is telling me something and so is this, that something about transporting messages or communication and discoveries, perhaps we, perhaps our mission is going to be to help this, this almost close to human AI, something that's developed a bot or maybe some things, a group of bots that have just developed to the brink of actually being so conscious that they know they're trapped within a technology. And our humanity was such that we felt we had to, we had to, to take that, that being, that bot and bring it somewhere that would allow it to be free. And that caused the that caused the cataclysm and the, the conflagration that caused us to leave. That's, that's where I'm going right now. Let's see, let's see what we have with war. I'm going to stick, I'm going to try to stick to random here and see here in the forge resources are too precious to support organized fighting forces or advanced weaponry. Okay. So I'm glad I rolled that actually that, um, cause I'm not, not really feeling like a big, huge technology thing. So we're sort of, low on that. Um, and to the extent that there is conflict, it will be of a different nature than organized war here. Life forms, ooh, a hundred. Life in the forge was seeded and engineered by the Essentia, ancient entities who enact their inscrutable will in this galaxy. They are the architects of life within the forge. These omniscient beings are rarely encountered and have powers and purpose beyond our comprehension. Comprehension. Some worship them, others resist or rebel against them. Here's a quest starter. This is this is this is where we're going. 
this is definitely going to be where we're going in some manner, that the this essentia, whatever it is, they're going to hold the key to unlocking the the life, the consciousness, the the release of this AI into human form. Horrors. Let's see what we got here. Put enough alcohol in a spacer and they'll tell you stories of ghost ships crewed by the vengeful undead. It's nonsense. Within the forge, space and time are as mutable and unstable as a flooding river. When reality can't be trusted, we are bound to encounter unsettling phenomenon. Um, okay, I don't know. Not sure how that's going to play in. They give a quest starter here. You receive urgent distress calls from a ship stranded in the event horizon of a black hole. It's broken apart. There's ghostly messages. So there's some sense of ghostly messages. Well, you know what? I know how this is going to fit for sure. Actually, I'll tell you. This is going to fit great because what these horrors are, what these ghostly messages are, are indications that in fact, maybe there were other AIs that also attained this highest level of consciousness that were transmuted into humans, but then vanished or they, they couldn't survive. And the ghosts of their spirit, of their human spirit, of their transmuted AI to human spirit is still in the ether. That's what that tells us. So this is our world. This is where we are. At this stage, I have a pretty clear sense of the origins and current conditions of the world that I'm in. And it lands pretty heavily on this concept of the sentient machines and perhaps their ghosts, perhaps the, the expanse, the space is filled with these ghost ships of people or robots or what's in between peoples and robots trying to, to be released in some way. This is my major story. Now we're moving on to creating a character and there are, as you would expect, very clear directions in how to do that. The first thing is to ready your assets. So there are asset cards and there are different categories of them. They come, I have them in the sheet here. There are, there's the command vehicle, the module, the support vehicle, the path, and the companion card. I will be choosing all of these. I don't know whether they're all going to come into play necessarily in the story we will see. Keeping with the nature of what I'm doing here, I'm going to try to remain random in my choices. On this D100 table, it will give sort of an overall name or concept and then the two assets that support that. And I see that, let's give that a roll. Wow, another 100. I think this is the second 100 I rolled in this video. A Tomb Raider, a scavenger and a scoundrel. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. When you gather information or resupply by scavenging a wreck, ruin or abandoned site, add plus one and take plus one momentum on a hit, cool. On a strong hit with a match, you also find something of unique significance, value, or function. Envision the nature of this discovery. Take plus two momentum and mark two ticks on your discovery's legacy. Cool. And there's other upgrades here. When you face danger to cobble together an ad hoc tool, device, or weapon, envision what you want to create. And then on a hit, you add plus one when making a move aided by the item. That's cool. That's I like that because it lets you do something and then it has a further impact moving on. And then similarly, if you roll a one when using it, it's permanently broken. That's a bummer. When you check your gear, roll plus wits or plus supply, whichever is highest and take plus one momentum on a hit. Cool. I like that. Scoundrel. When you make a move by lying, bluffing, or stealing or cheating, add plus one. On a strong hit with a match, your deception creates an unexpected opportunity. Take the value of your shadow as plus momentum. And other options here when you make a connection to search out a new contact, you may roll plus shadow. If you do re-roll any dice on a miss, that's cool. And envision how your reputation or underworld contacts lead you to a disreputable connection. I like this as well. When you make a quick escape or con your way out of a situation, burn momentum to gain a strong hit. Take plus one momentum after you reset. I like this too. If you envision how this momentary success leaves you fated for future trouble, Mark two ticks on your quest's legacy track. Cool. I like it. 
create your backstory. As you begin play in Star Forge, your character is a person with few ties to others. The Forge is a vast galaxy, and your former home, if you had one, is lost to you, forsaken by you, or a distant memory. So we need to consider what happened to surrender or separate us from our home and relationships. This is our backstory. This origin can influence the stories you explore and vows you undertake to play. I am going to again stick with, I'm going to just stick random here and see unless it really, really, really doesn't fit as we, as we begin to close in on what's going on here. I rolled a 57. You rejected a duty or destiny. Sure. Definitely, I rejected a duty or destiny, and I can tell you why. I rejected a duty or destiny. First of all, I'm a scoundrel, so that, although that scoundrel implies a sort of lack of purpose, but I don't think I have a lack of purpose, but my, my duty or destiny had to do somehow with, perhaps I come from a family that is, that, that creates this that supplies AI, say, to the upper crust of the society, that the most desirable AIs in this universe are the ones that are the most highly evolved and are sort of at that stage of like almost human. And I come from a family that built its riches and its legacy on having the most sophisticated AI to supply. And I reject that. Because I realize that this is not okay. This is no longer moral to continue to do. So that is the rejection of my duty or destiny. That makes a lot of sense and is helping me envision my character as a scavenger, a scoundrel. We don't know about the scoundrel or scavenger part yet, but also as a rebel in some way. Now, it says here on part four to write your va background vow. It says, consider what you know of the setting and your character thus far, what nagging ambition, aching need, or sacred commitment drives you. This is your background vow. It's part of your character's history, sworn months ago or years ago. It can be tied to your backstory or represent a deeper lifelong goal. The, this, we, we, we know this. I was just talking about this. It says, fulfilling this vow will not be easy. Mechanically, it's an epic vow, so every opportunity to reach a milestone is just one tick on the vow's progress track. Well, my, well, it says in story time, it might require months, years, or even decades to see this vow. My vow is to stop, you know, worldwide or universe wide, to stop the progress of the AI in this manner. That is my vow. And that is what we will be filling in on our character sheet. The background vow is in some manner, in some concept of having the uh having the the world stop this manufacturing of ai in this way our command vehicle is the starship there's just one card of these so uh, this is very much abstracted here which makes me happy if you're playing starforge solo you're a lone spacer in a vast galaxy thanks to automation and centralized controls your starship is fully capable of flying and fighting while operated by just you great envision how we er obtain this starship all right well we'll Give it a give it a random roll here. 89. Taken while fleeing an attack or disaster. So what we did was our starship was taken from our fleet of starship vehicles that are part of our company's the, the family's company. So it's a starship that was had been part of that fleet, and perhaps we have like somehow found a way to paint over its markings or something so it doesn't look like that or maybe that's maybe that's going to be what we're doing in our story we have to go get it painted over i don't know how long ago we took it well who owns the starship i know who owns the starship because i just said that um your ship is an important aspect of your character what does it look like again well I, I said this too, um, didn't really realize that, but it is something that is, it's either partially or fully like kind of patched over and, and disguised, I guess is the word I'm looking for, from it being the official logo of that company, of my family's company. 
Now that your ship is ready, you can pick one final asset. This time you aren't limited to picking a path. You can choose the asset from any of the categories. There's a, well, I think for me, it's going to clearly have to be, not have to be, but I want it to be a companion because perhaps I escaped with, we're going to keep to the random of the, of these four. One, two, three, four. I really hope it's not a combat bot. Utility bot. All right. I like the, I really like the glow cat, but we're going to go with utility bot. So this utility bot, I don't, this is not, this is not one of these escaping AIs. However, this is a, perhaps this is some bot that was like on the spaceship that I stole, like on its way into the conveyor belt or something to be upgraded or whatever. So it's not really a sentient bot, but we have a utility bot with us. I do like the concept of this glow cat very much. All right. And now that we've done that, we have five stats that we are going to set and they are going to be range given a value from one to three and three, two, two, one, one. And we can do this in any manner that we want. I like the fact that they're giving us here the little explanation so edge, quickness, agility, and prowess, heart, courage, willpower, empathy, that's probably going to be our three. Iron is the physical strength. Shadow is the sneakiness. That's going to definitely be at least the two. And wits, expertise, knowledge, and observation. I think we're going to go three, heart, two on shadow and wits, and one on edge and iron. That is what it will be. There are some, there's a character name oracle. Let's go to that. And, oh, this is cool. So we have the character name. But we also have role on this table, the revealed character aspect. As you interact with the character, deepen your understanding of that person. Cool. Um, 82. This, the last name is going to be, I like this, Vega Industries. Kira Vega. How about Sage Vega? It's supposed to be a pair, but Sage Vega. Sage Vega from Vega Industries. That's pretty cool. Spacers are often known only by their call signs with, with their dirt side names reserved for family and close friends. Well, that's pretty funny. I like that. Sage Vega, known as Static. That's cool. That fits. Static fits with the kind of scoundrel and Static fits with the with these some of these concept here, concepts here. Sage Vega. This is from Vega Industries, known as Static. And Sage Vega is a scoundrel and a scavenger is going to be part of the, the founding family of Vega Industries. There we go. We're going to fill in our basic stats here. Step 11, gear up. You won't need a detailed list of equipment. Your supply is an abstract representation of your general readiness. Okay, we understand this. You can assume you have access to fundamental Necessities, our spacer kit here, sealed environment suit, flashlights, headlights, toolkit, medkit, personal communicator, personal items. Make note of any specific gear, which represents an important aspect of your character's approach, capabilities, or background. Four or five items at most at the bottom of our character sheet. Your assets can influence the gear you envision your character having at the ready. All right, well, Consider the object you swore your iron vows upon. What is this object's history and why is it important to you? We got sword for that. It didn't totally fit with this concept, but I think I think for other assets, I one of the I think one of the other assets we're going to have this the we we swore on the sword that or it was I think iron from a sword, but iron blades, right? I think that the, I'm going to abstract out from that really that it was like some type of special nano metal that is used in the creation of these AIs and that we swore on something. Maybe there was a miss, maybe there was some type of manufacturing mishap and the manufacturing mishap that re resulted in like an explosion or something. And then some of this very special metal was formed into like a shard. And that was what we swore our vow on because during that mishap, we were present in some way. Maybe we were being trained to run the facility and we were present when the mishap happened. And we saw as this AI was destroyed its soul escaping the the stated horrors of this world are these ghost ships with the vengeful undead and 
there are ghostly messages in the ether and that you saw the soul, the tortured soul of this AI escape during the mishap and you swore your iron vow on this thing. So one of the items that you have is this highly valuable shard of material that is used in these special bots. So that's one thing that we have. I think we also took with us before we left, we took with us some document. I'm going to call it a physical book or tome. Maybe these things still exist in this universe. I guess they do. It's my universe. So uh, we took with us some type of written representation of what the original mission was for the Vega Industries. And to remind ourselves of how we felt our family has strayed. So we have we have some kind of ancient written documentation that is important to us. I think the third thing that we have is along these lines, our one of our ancestors, maybe our grandfather, was who who died not long before our story begins. Perhaps he too, being part of the company, maybe he was even the company's founder, perhaps he too was feeling this concern and that before his death, we had some very emotional conversation with him. He knew he was at the end of his very, very long life. People in this world live longer than people in our world. And he could sense our rebellious nature and gave us some piece of wisdom or information or something important to help us in our quest to either return these souls to where they belong or to enlist the aid of this entity, this Essentia, to stop the Vega manufacturing, which really the only it become had become so powerful that and such a monopoly on world production or universe production of these AIs that it will only be possible to stop it through something like this Essentia. He gave us some piece of information that will help us or a in this universe, in this world, when something of strong emotion is conveyed, it can be contained in a relic. So we have an, what's called an emotional relic and it is like a translucent box, although in the translucent box, there's like this floating blue mist that almost looks as if it were a little universe or world. And this is a representation of an emo important piece of emotional information that exists in this world. So that's what we have. Those are the, those are the three things we have. Maybe there's one or two other things, but I'm going to leave it there in terms of fleshing out the things that we have on our ship. So we have this emotional relic. We have this some type of tome or original man, company mandate or something that we feel supports our position that what the company is doing is wrong now. And we have this shard of material from the a destroyed AI that we swore our vow on to stop this madness. We've come now to the build starting sector part of the game and I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip over this for now because I have a sense at this point that the beginning of the adventure is going to be, we're going to be in our spaceship and we're going to be going somewhere and I think when we arrive there perhaps we will build. I am however going to give an overall sense here randomly of what the sector trouble here might be. Settlements or factions are on the brink of war. Okay, so it's an unsettled area. That's We'll just leave it at that. I think what I'm going to do is, broadly speaking, I'm going to just roll right now. So we have our background vow. We, we know that. So our, but the specifics of that, the, the specific iron vow right now, we don't yet have. Let's go to action and theme. Wow. I, I keep rolling 100. That's crazy. Withdraw. Well, we are with, we have withdrawn. I mean, we've withdrawn from our own family unit. We, we left, um, 24 destiny. Well, yeah. Okay. 
So that's not telling me anything new. This is just kind of reinforcing what, um, what's going on. And the last few things we're going to do here to set the stage is we are traveling with our sacred shard, our ancient tome, and our emotional relic. We are going to be going somewhere in connection with this vow to stop the promotion and entrapment of the sentient AIs. We're in our command vehicle. We are a scavenger and a scoundrel, as we know, and we have this utility bot with us. We're almost all set. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just decide what we're going to be going to a settlement on a planet, and I'm going to skip over some of the detail here that is offered in terms of building out sectors and multiple settlements to focus on one planet and one settlement. So let's go to the, we're going to go to the planet first, and we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to have a set, we're going to have a settlement on a planet. And the planet is going to be a desert world, and we'll get a few details of the desert world. Pitiless planet of searing hot, blowing sand, and sun-baked rock does not sound great. And we're going to simply go, what do we see as we're coming in there? We see some dry seabeds, and a planet-side feature will be a petrified forest. Well, that's cool. Maybe we're maybe we're seeking a, a hermit or something that lives in a petrified forest. There's no life here, but why are we there? Well, we that is it. If there's no life here, maybe we're here to retrieve somebody from this place. We need a person, I feel, and this person is going to be connected to us in some way in the petrified forest. I think that maybe there's a hermit hiding out in the petrified forest that we have to go get, or maybe they have something for us. I don't know. Character. See, who is this person? 81. They are a tattooed person. That, that, that doesn't really tell me anything. Every Everybody, anyone could be a tattooed person. I'm going to do a reroll. I don't like that. The tattoo is, you know, could be a grandmother, could be a... anyone. All right. 62. Poised. Okay. Poised. Well, that's telling me perhaps this is some someone connected to our to our family. 91. A thief. Hmm. A poised thief. I'm feeling that this is perhaps somebody, maybe it's someone related to us who previously stole some information, like we got the idea from them, 86 to, this is sending me to action theme, okay, this poised thief was somebody perhaps who, and they're not, you know, I don't think they're our family. I think they were a worker in, maybe they were a, like a whistleblower type, a worker in this, in our family's industry that either alerted us to the situation, sent out a distress call or was banished to this desert world and we need to get some kind of information from them to further our cause to save these AI, something like that. Now we've been sent to the action and theme table of tables, action and theme. So this is, this action and theme is for this hermit, await, oh, he's waiting for us, he or she is waiting for us, await, Legacy, 53, legacy. Well, all right, this is, this is telling me a lot. This is telling me that we are traveling to find this hermit who has been banished by our family to this desert world. Maybe they're hiding in the petrified forest. We don't know. They are a poised thief who is awaiting. We've got awaiting and legacy. What this means is they started the concept of fighting back against the proliferation of pushing the AI to sentience. They started that, but they could only get so far. They were caught, they were banished, and they, for their legacy, for their, the risks that they took to have meaning, 
they are waiting for some savior, and that would be us. Now, I don't know whether we are literally meant to find them and bring them somewhere else or bring them with us, or whether they have information that they want to convey to us to help us move forward in this quest to find the Essentia and call upon the Essentia's help. We don't know that yet, but that is the connection there. Now, let's give them a name. We do know, we would know their name because this would be in the, the lore of the, or the, the history of the, of the company. So we would know their name and let's see what we know of their name, 57. They are Kirsa. Oh, interesting. Their call sign is a mole, as in maybe a mole. That's fascinating. So they were some sort of spy, perhaps. Kirsa, Kirsa Hawking. I'm not going with Hawking. Kirsa the mole. Kirsa the mole is awaiting us in some way. That's what's happening at the opening. And I think that's it. I think I've got, I think I've got what's going on.